Before we uh, move on in section 10.1, I want to quickly run through that example we were working on to make sure everybody's at the same place. So we were trying to sketch an ellipse, uh, and the first thing we did is we rearranged the terms so the x terms were together, the y terms were together, and we moved the constant to the other side of the equation. Then we factored out the common factor of 9 from the x terms and 4 from the y terms. And the goal was we're trying to, we need to rewrite this in the standard form of the ellipse. And so we need to get a perfect square here. So to do that, we need to complete the square. So uh, we factored out the 9 so we could have a coefficient of 1 in front of the x squared because it makes completing the square easier. Divide the linear uh, coefficient by 2. So this is a 2. And square, you get 4. So I want to add a 4 here to complete the square. But notice, I've added 4 in the parentheses, but I've really added 36. Okay, so since I had 36 here, I've changed the original equation. So to balance out, I need to add a 36 over here to make it a true statement. Same thing for the y term. The linear term, or the coefficient of the linear term is negative 6. Divide that by 2, you get negative 3. Square that, you get 9. So I need to add a 9 here, but I really haven't added a 9. I've really added a 36. So I need to add another 36 there. So if we've done this correctly, we should have perfect squares here. Uh, and we do, because this is x plus 2 quantity squared. And then this is y minus 3 quantity squared. Okay? That was the whole point of that, is so we can get rid of the, you know, the linear term. <clears throat> and now we just have a, a quantity squared. And to make it look like the standard form of the ellipse, we divide both sides of the equation by 36. I'm going to cancel as I go. So this is x plus 2 squared over 4 plus y minus 3 squared over 9 is 1. Okay? Remember, the standard form of the ellipse is x minus h squared over a squared plus y minus k squared over b squared equals 1. You always want to get a 1 over here. Okay? Notice, if these two numbers were the same, suppose this were, you know, uh, you know, 25 and 25, you can multiply through by 25. You'd have x plus 2 squared plus y minus 3 squared is 25, which is the standard form of the circle, right? Okay, so now the last part we want to do is graph. Well, let's identify the center. And <clears throat> so where's the center? It's x minus h, so h here is negative 2, and y minus k, so k is 3. So there's the center. So negative 2, 3. So there's the center. Now I put a dot there. That, notice the center does not satisfy the equation. When you plug in negative 2 here and 3 here, you'll get 0 equals 1. The, the center is not part of the... Um, uh, it doesn't satisfy the equation, so the center is not part of the graph. right? The center is not on the graph, but I'm just using it to help me sketch. Now what do we do? Remember this was you know a squared and b squared. So in the x direction, you move 2, and in the y direction, you move 3 away from the center. Now, I've messed up my, my scaling here. So in the, x, oh, in the x direction, I'm moving 2, 2 to the right, and 2 to the left. And in the y direction, I have to move 3. Okay, so if I go 1, 2, 3. So in the y direction from the center, I go up 3, I go down 3. And then there's your ellipse. Okay, so that's not too bad. Uh, something you can do to, to check, you know, the, the four points I have here, the vertices, you know, on either side, check and see that they satisfy your equation, you know, that I erased here. So as a check, you know, plug that in, plug that in, plug that in, plug that in, and make sure it makes the equation true, and then you know you're all right. Okay, the next example says, consider the ellipse x squared over 4 plus y squared over 1 is 1. We know it's an ellipse because it fits the standard form. Why don't we do a rough sketch of this? Um, but now, where's the center? Is x minus 0 squared, y minus 0 squared. So the center is at 0, 0. No problem. And in the x direction, we're going to go left and right uh, 2. And in the y direction, the square root of 1 is 1. We're going up and down 1 from the center. So that ellipse is like that. Okay, so that's no problem. And the question says, uh, notice I'm doing A and B out of order here. B says, 
find the volume of the solid generated by revolving the region bounded by an ellipse about its major axis. Okay, the major axis is the x-axis because it's uh, it's wide, m wider than it is taller. Okay, so we're gonna uh, volume. We're rotating about the x-axis. Now we can use symmetry here uh, to get the volume. I mean, we could just take this region right here, rotate that around, and then double it to get the other side. So that's what that's what I'm going to do. Now, uh, if we use um, the um, disk method, right? So remember what you do with, with disk method, right? Again, I'm, I'm doing this region here. You draw vertical, you know, rectangles like this. And remember with disk method, the volume was uh, pi times the radius square, where the radius is the height of the rectangle. Pi times the radius square, okay? Uh, and you have to integrate. So we need to, now if we solve for y, you don't really have to solve for y. I'm, I'm looking ahead at it, but if I subtract the x squared, notice you get y squared is 1 minus x squared over 4. And so for the region I'm using here, y is, I'm going to go ahead and solve for y. y is the positive square root of a 1 over x squared over 4, right? Because I'm up here, right? But the y is positive, right? So what's the volume here? The volume is pi times the integral of the radius squared. Well, the radius is the height of the rectangle, which is just y, but it's y squared. So I didn't really need to solve for y here because I'm gonna square it anyway. So it's one minus x squared over four dx. And notice I'm only integrating from zero to two, zero to two, but notice that's just gonna be the volume when I rotate this around the x-axis. They want the whole thing, so I have to double it. Okay, so again, the 2 pi is not part of the disk method formula. The pi is, but I'm using the 2 because I'm doubling. It's easier to have a 0 here than go minus 2. To, I could integrate and go negative 2 to 2 and, and then leave off the 2. Well, this shouldn't be that hard to work out. <coughs> uh, it, it's a polynomial, so we can integrate right away. That's x minus x cubed over 12 from uh, evaluated from 0 to 2. Okay, so when we plug in 2, we get 2 minus uh, 8 twelfths, which is 2 thirds. And then when I plug in 0, I get 0. Notice that's what makes this a little bit easier to do the symmetry here. I have the 2 here and the 0 here, and then when I plug in 0, it doesn't give me anything. So this is 2 pi times, well, 2 is 6 thirds minus 2 thirds is 4 thirds. And I get 8 pi over 3. So that one's not so hard. Okay, and then part A here says, <clears throat> find the area of the region bounded by the ellipse. Okay, so now I'm, I'm, I'm going to do symmetry. Now they want, they want the area of the entire ellipse, so I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to take the area here and multiply by 4. Okay. So the area is 4 times the integral from 0 to 2. Remember, the area of the curve is just the, area, the integral of the y value, right? So now I actually have to integrate that root. Square root of 1 minus x squared over 4 dx. Okay. Now again, we did the square here because the, the volume was integral of pi times the radius squared. And so the y value squared turned out to be that. But when you integrate under curve, it's just the integral of the function. Notice this is not a function, but when I take y as the positive square root, that's a function. Now, how are we supposed to integrate this thing? I mean, it's certainly not straight integration. I don't know the formula for this, and my guess is you don't either. Does anybody have an idea of what to do here? Okay, notice we have a constant minus a constant times x squared. That's reminiscent of our trigonometric substitution. Uh, section. Okay, so that's why I'm going to try x equals. Now this one's a little different from ones we did before. Uh, usually we were trying to adjust for the 1. We have our 1 here. We want this to be 1 minus what trig function, you know, we always use sine when it was 1 minus something squared. So we want, we want, to, we want to have a sine here, so that's no problem. I want sine of theta. But then what else should I expect? I want to get rid of the 4. 
right? So if I'm dividing by four and I want to get rid of it, I need to have a four in the numerator, so I need a two sine theta, right? Because two squared is going to be four, and then the fours drop out, and then I get one minus sine squared. So dx is going to be two cosine theta theta. And again, there's no adjusting here because there's dx already. Okay, so if I continue with my formula here, um, I have square root of 1 minus x squared is 4 sine squared theta over the 4, and then dx is 2 cosine theta d theta. Let me check my work here. So 1 minus 4 sine squared over 4, dx is that. Okay, now I'm switching to a new variable. And I have a definite integral, so I'm going to change the endpoint, so then I don't have to go back to x's again. Okay? So for a little scratch work here, uh, when x is 0, 0 is 2 sine theta. So sine theta is 0. Now again, when we're doing these trig substitutions, we're assuming theta is in the same range as our inverse trig functions. So where is sine, remember, uh, inverse sine is from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. In that interval, where sine equal to zero, well, that's at zero radians. Right? Sine of zero, zero. So my uh, my zero for x translates to zero for theta. Now, what about uh, when x is two? So when x is two, I get two is two sine theta. So sine theta is one. Now, where is sine theta equal to 1 from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2? That happens at pi over 2. So I've, I've, I've changed my uh, endpoints, so I don't have to go back to x's at the end. Okay, so now let's continue here. I can pull the 2 out front. That gives me an 8. Now, what do we have here? Um, let me not do too many things at once. So the 4's drop out, I get 1 minus sine squared, which is, so the square root of cosine squared. Okay, so this is 8 integral 0 pi over 2. Now remember, remember when we did the trig substitutions and we used the x as sine, we convinced ourselves that the square root of cosine squared was cosine. But even if we didn't know that here, notice, uh, even if we hadn't done that before, notice we're integrating from 0 to pi over 2, which is the first quadrant, and cosine's positive in the first quadrant anyway. So the square root of cosine squared is just cosine times this cosine is cosine squared theta. theta. Okay, now we're back to the trigonometric integral section. How do we integrate even powers of cosine? Well, remember we use the identity 1 plus cosine 2 theta over 2. Remember, you double the angle and then you can get rid of the square. So if I pull the 2 out front, or the half out front, I get 4. And now I can integrate what's left. Okay, so I'm just integrating 1 plus cosine 2 theta. Uh, the integral, the antiderivative of 1 with respect to theta is theta. Uh, this is a linear substitution, uh, so I have a cosine stuff. The integral of cosine x is sine x, so the integral of cosine linear is sine linear, but you have to adjust for the slope, one, one over the slope, one half. And now we just plug in. So plug in pi over 2, one half, sine of uh, 2 times pi over 2 is pi, and then minus, well, when you plug in 0 here and 0 here, you just get 0, no problem. And then the question is, now what's, what's a sine of pi? All right, well, pi radians is here on the unit circle. Pick the point one unit away. That's minus 1, 0. Cosine's the first number. Sine's the second. That turns out to be 0. And 4 times pi over 2 is 2 pi. Okay, so that was the area of, of, of the ellipse here. Now, you may not know this, <coughs> but uh, if you have an ellipse and the center's here and one of the axes is length A and the other axis is length, well, you know, uh, B, uh, the area of an ellipse is pi AB. 
And so it shouldn't surprise you that we got 2 pi because it's 2 times 1 times pi. And this formula shouldn't surprise you because if you had a circle, that would be r and that would be r. So you have pi times r times r is pi r squared. So that shouldn't surprise you. Okay, so then now we shift to the last conic section, which is the hyperbola. So let me draw a picture here to explain you know, the, the geometrical uh, definition. So you can read all that paragraph before. So what they're saying here, so this is under pictures. <clears throat> now just for ease, I'm going to put the center you know, at, the, at the origin, even though it doesn't have to be, just to make it easier to draw. Okay, so we have, a, we have the center <clears throat> of the uh, hyperbola. And what you do is you have a focus and you have another focus. So we have two foci, just like we did with the ellipse. And they mention, they mention uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the line through the two foci uh, intersects a hyperbola at two points called the vertices. Okay, so there's a vertex here, we're getting ahead of ourselves, and a vertex over here, and we have symmetry. Uh, the midpoint of the transverse axis, so the transverse axis is the um, segment connecting the vertices. So the transverse axis is from here to here, and the, and the, mid, the midpoint of that's called the center. Again, I'm getting, I got ahead of myself. But, but you really start with two foci. I mean, that's what you start with. I haven't gotten to the geometry yet. Okay, so uh, the hyperbola, a hyperbola is the set of all points, the locus of points for which the absolute value of the difference between the distances from the two distinct fixed points called foci is constant. Okay, so it's sort of like the ellipse. Remember when we did the ellipse, an ellipse was the, the locus of points such that the sum of the two distances from, the, that, uh, from a point to the foci was constant. Here it's just the difference. Right? Now they're say, they say in the definition that the, ver the two vertices are on the uh, hyperbola. Okay, so just to, to talk about distances, let me call this distance A and this distance A, and I'm going to call the distance from the vertex to the focus over here. I'm just picking Q to pick Q, and same thing here. Okay, so if the vert, if this point, if this vertex is on the hyperbola, it says the absolute value of the difference from the vertex to each of the foci is constant. Okay, well how far is it from this, the vertex here to this focus? It's Q plus A plus A. Okay, so the absolute value of Q plus A plus A. But then minus the distance from the vertex to this focus, which is Q. And notice the Q's drop out and you get 2 A. I'm assuming A is positive. Okay. And notice if you do the same thing with the, this vertex, the distance here is Q, the distance here is 2 A cup plus Q, the difference is 2A again. Okay, so I'm focusing on the axis here. Again, they said these two points are on the hyperbola, so the, the absolute value of the distance is, is constant. Now, what if I pick a point out here somewhere, <clears throat> and I call that XY? And I'm, I'm assuming that that point is on the hyperbola. Well, what, what must be true? The distance from that point to the, each, of the foci, each of the foci so suppose I call that distance D1, I call that D2. The absolute value of D1 minus D2 has to be that fixed distance. Well, I just said what the fixed distance would have to be. It'd have to be 2A. So the absolute value of D1 minus D2 would have to be 2A because that was the fixed distance I got when I worked on the vertices. And obviously there's symmetry involved, right? Because it's the absolute value Right, if, I, if I move this point uh, over here, right, if this is xy, it's going to be minus xy, and I do, oop, not to the vertex, and I do the distances to the foci, notice that's d2 and that's d1, the absolute value of d2 minus d1 would be 2a as well. So, right, because of the absolute value, if I do d1 minus d2 and take the absolute value, and d2 minus d1 take the absolute value, you're going to get the same answer. Right. So there's going to be symmetry. So if this point is on the hyperbola, this one will be two. That's why you have two vertices here. If this point's on the hyperbola, that one will be two because of the absolute value. 
Okay, so it's all the points that satisfy that. And what it turns out to look like is, and, and obviously, you know, if there's symmetry the other way too. If this point is on the hyperbola, so will this one, because that distance minus that distance, the absolute value is still going to be the 2a. So you have symmetry in a lot of different directions. And it, it goes like this. Okay. So that's what the hyperbola turns out to be if you do that. So, so notice we're symmetric about, well, in my picture, I put the center at the origin. So we're, here we're symmetric about the y-axis and symmetric about the x-axis. Okay. So if the center is not at the origin, you're going to be some, uh, if it's up here, if you draw, a, you know, think axes through the center, you'll be symmetric about that horizontal line and symmetric about the vertical line going through the center. Okay, let's do a quick example here. Uh, it says, sketch the graph of a hyperbola 4x squared minus y squared of 16. Now, I, I didn't mention the standard form. The standard form of the hyperbola, it's listed up above. It looks exactly like the ellipse, except for instead of a plus between the x and the y terms, you have a minus. Okay, that's the only difference. So, notice if this were a plus, I'd have an ellipse. Since I have a minus, it's a hyperbola. Right? So you still want the 1 on the other side. If you divide all the way through by 16, I get x squared over 4 minus y squared over 16 is 1. Okay? And it's still the x minus h and y minus k. That's how you find the center. Notice the center here is 0, 0. Okay? Now here's how, you, here's how you sketch a hyperbola. Right? It, we need to find the vertices. <coughs> And, well, I didn't mention, but, but there, there, there are asymptotes here. There are oblique asymptotes that go through the center. Again, all that's mentioned in the paragraph above, and they give you, they give you the formula. But we're just going to cut to the chase here. So I have the standard form of the hyperbola here. The center's at 0, 0. Okay. So here's the center, 0, 0. Now, what you do is do, do exactly like you did before with the ellipse. Move 2 in the x direction, the square root of 4, and 4 in the y direction, the square root of 16. So I'm going to move 2 in the x direction, and 2 in the y direction, and then 4 in the, I'm sorry, uh, 2 either way in the x direction. In the y direction, I'm going to move up 4 and down 4. Okay. So from the center, move, and again, I'm moving up and down because that's y here. So notice if it's the other way around, well, you still move left or right. <laughs> Okay, so wherever the x is, you move left or right that distance, the square root of that, and y is move up or down that distance. Now I'm going to put a little box here, a dashed box, because it's not part of the graph here. Okay, so when you do the dashed box like that, the corners of the box here, right, the oblique asymptotes pass through the corners and the center. So if I put a dashed line here through the center and the corners of the box, and the center, oops, and the corners of the box. Those are my hours. I don't really need the box now, right? So those are my uh, asymptotes. I just did the box to help me sketch the asymptotes. Right? And now that you have the asymptotes, it's just a matter of figuring out, um, you know, which way does this go? Right? So it's either going to be the hyperbola is either going to do like this or or you know, like this. Now the question is where? Well, here, notice. When x is plus or minus 2 and y is 0, it makes the equation true, right? 2 here and 0 here gives me a 1. Negative 2 here and 0 here gives me 1. These two points satisfy the equation, so they're on the hyperbola. So you don't have to memorize, you know, where, you know, we're not trying to, I'm not asking you to find the fo foci or anything, right? You know it's either up here and down here or, or here and here. Right? Notice 0, 4, 0, 4 does not satisfy the equation because when x is 0 and y is 4, you'll get negative 1 is 1. So you know it's not those, and it's going to be those. So you don't have to memorize If x is first, it goes this way. If y is first, it's good. You don't have to memorize that, right? Just do what I did with the box and realize, does that point work? No, this one does, that one doesn't, this one does. And so your hyperbola is going to go this way. Right? So it's not that hard to sketch. Okay. So do like we did for the ellipse and make a box. That'll tell you where your, uh, your oblique asymptotes are. And then, uh, or your slant asymptotes, really not oblique, your slant asymptotes. And then you can figure out by plugging in the numbers which way it goes. 
Okay, so and notice they give you the formula uh, up at the top there for the um, the asymptotes, but you could figure that out, right? You don't have to memorize that either. If you know that point and you know that point, you could figure out the equation of the line that goes through both of those. So there's you don't even have to memorize that. Okay, so that's how you you sketch a hyperbola.